Hello, everyone. Welcome to another live. And uh, please let me know if you can hear me or not, because I actually forgot to check that I've got that microphone on. So let me know in the comments field if you can hear me or if you can't hear me, I'll have to go back out and come back in again. Welcome, everybody, to the live. This one is about initiations and also my experience of initiation as well. Welcome, everybody, to the live. Hello. Let me know if you can hear me and how well you can hear me because I think I've got my camera microphone on instead of my um, other microphone. So let me know in the comments field if you can hear me uh, clearly or not. Today we are talking about initiations. So I'm going to talk about the whole, I guess, the whole theory behind initiation and also my own experience of Wiccan initiation uh, back in the 1990s. So I'll, I'll probably weave the two things together. Before we do, though, uh, while I'm waiting for people to come on to the live, uh, welcome to those of you watching the replay. Welcome to those of you who are new to the Mystery Witch School channel as well. Welcome to the channel. Here we talk about all things uh, Wiccan, witchcraft, and magic, tarot, and shadow work, which is one of my favorite topics. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Thank you for letting me know that you can hear me. And if you want to know where to start your witchcraft practice, if it's something that uh, you've been wanting to do, but you just don't know where to start because there's a lot of information out there and not a lot of structure when it comes to how you work the information. I have a free video. It's called How to Start Your Witchcraft Practice. There's a link in the description field below this video for how you can access it. And I'm also going to just pop the link in the comments field as well. I'm not even sure whether you can access it from there, but I'll put it in there anyway. So that just gives you, it's a, a video that just gives you an outline of where you can start and how you can pace yourself along the way with your learning so that you're not having to learn everything at once because that is almost impossible. Okay. Uh, also be aware there's a super chat and uh, super thanks as well uh, if you want to donate to the channel. So welcome, everybody. We are in eclipse season at the moment and... Uh, We've just entered into April, well, here in Australia today. And uh, so we're in a very, very powerful month astrologically. So good luck, everybody. <laughs> and um, may everybody be able to ride uh, the rest of the year in uh, a very graceful manner, no matter what what happens or, or what we experience um, here on planet Earth. So just a hello to everybody. Hello, Maura. Hello, Shane. Hello, Gaylord. Hello, Michaela, Sandy, Lewis, Brandon, and Swakvan. Hello. Embrace the momentum. Absolutely. Yes. So let's talk about initiation, okay? And what it's all about because there's some there's come there's kind of a bit of a difference between the eastern concept of initiation and western concept of initiation and my experience of the western version which is the wiccan version was uh similar to the eastern version uh when i was initiated into sufism but there was more different explanation about what the whole process was. So from an Eastern point of view or from a mystical point of view, from, say, a Buddhist point of view or Sufi point of view or many of those Eastern traditions, initiation is a beginning, so it's a new beginning, in, and that's what initiate means, to initiate something, to begin something. And literally it is a new beginning. But for them, the person who initiates you is also transferring their lineage or and their the energy of that lineage uh, into you, through you. So there's like a transference of some kind that goes between you and the person that is initiating you. 
Now, I'm assuming that that's the same, of course, uh, for a lot of the Western esoteric traditions as well. It wasn't explained to me like that, though, when I was initiated into Wicca, it wasn't explained as being like a transmission or anything like that. So I just wanted to mention that that wasn't explained to me. And initiation is is something that does seem to be very prevalent in a lot of human, uh, a lot of cultures around the world to ritually begin something. It's like a statement, uh, like a, a rite of passage. When we have significant events in our lives, we often have ceremonies around them. So when we're born, we'll, there's usually a ceremony around the baby naming, okay, or if they're being initiated into a religion like a, a christening, for example, there's there's like an initiation of a welcome to a baby when it comes into, into the world. There's uh, initiations into, not so much these days, but definitely in the past, um, an initiation into adolescence. So there'd be rituals and ceremonies around that. Then you've got uh, coupling like marriages and you've got um, funerals and all manner of initiations, which is kind of what these things are. They're a human way of celebrating something, a human way of saying, hey, you know, you've started a milestone, let's celebrate in some way, let's make this um, something that's formal. It's the same when a lot of people move into a new home, they'll have a home, a housewarming party, that kind of thing. So you can look at initiations very much as just establishing ritually that something is new, something is beginning, or that it, at a particular stage of your journey throughout life, something's happening, something's new, something's beginning. There's new beginnings all the time. And I like that idea of there's newness all the time. There's always a beginning. There's endings and beginnings. We're always progressing along the path and initiations are just symbolic ways of showing us that progress and celebrating that progress with other people. Okay, yeah, it's like an ad adopting you into the lineage in a way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the significance of initiations is really marking um, that commitment and dedication to the craft or whatever you're being initiated to. So whether it's a self-initiation, so you're doing a dedication or a self-initiation yourself, as a ritual for you, or you're doing it in a coven environment, you're marking a very significant milestone in your life. You're saying, I'm committing to doing this and I'm dedicated to doing this. It might just be for a certain amount of time. You might just decide, well, I'm going to do it and see how it goes. Uh, you never know with an initiation how long it's going to last and whether you're going to stay there or not. But it is marking a commitment when you do decide to make that, that move to initiate. And even a self-initiation is a very special moment because you're really making that decision to, to really go down this path, to do the work and to learn about yourself and to connect to who you really are and you're making that commitment to do that. It establishes that deeper connection to the spiritual realm. It's like you're saying, I'm committing to myself. You know, I'm, I'm going to turn up for myself now spiritually. I'm going to commit to myself now spiritually. Uh, it's recognising your place, I guess, in the community too if you are in a group. So when I'm talking about initiation now, I'm talking about both self-initiation and coven initiation, and I'll talk about the differences later on between the two. Um, they're probably pretty self-explanatory, but <laughs> I'll talk a bit more about, about what they are and, you know, a lot of the, the philosophies behind the both of them. Um, but it's, it's recognising, if it's a coven environment, it's recognising your place in the coven because groups will tend to have initiation ceremonies uh, more so than people who are solitary because as humans, that's what we do. We do these ceremonies, as I've just talked about. The different stages of initiation, so you might have a, so in the case of the coven, my first coven anyway, 
we had like a crafting was the first initiation and I'd never come across that in any of the books that I'd read. It was like after your three months probation, you would be accepted into the coven. They'd find that you're a match for the coven. Um, then you would go through a crafting ceremony. And that crafting ceremony was really the first initiation, I guess. It was where you were saying, okay, I'm dedicating myself to the craft and I'm going to be a part of this particular group. And so you kind of, there's different ways that there's there's different symbolism for the changes um, in the Wiccan uh, tradition. If you probably read a lot of the books um, back into the Gardnerian and Alexandrian, you've got uh, the hand, like fastening the hands together. Uh, you've got the whole sky clad thing going on as a symbol of letting go of everything. Uh, it's a bit like when Anana went down into the underworld to visit her sister, Arishkigal, and she ended up having to be taking all the jewellery off, all the clothes off, all the adornments of life had to be taken off and she had to face her sister, which is the, the shadow side, totally naked, totally devoid of any ornamentation whatsoever. It was just basically her <laughs> as she was. And I, I think that from a gardenerian point of view, that was the whole point of doing initiation skyclad. A lot of covens still do it. Other covens don't do it. It's just something that came out of that um, Gardnerian era and probably that time. I think it was, you know, that that era in history too uh, as well. Things have changed now. Being naked's not such a big deal. So I think a lot of people don't really think too much about it these days. <laughs> But crafting was the first one in my group and then we did, I think it was a year later, we did first initiation and that was just a plain initiation. Other covens may go straight into initiation straight away and after maybe a probationary period and then the first real initiation is first degree initiation and then second degree initiation and third degree initiation. There are groups out there now, Wiccan groups out there that have even more initiations than that. So, you know, it's hard to keep up with the changes that are happening <laughs> with, with regards to what groups do. And all different groups and traditions are, do have variations and they are different. And sometimes they even call things by different names and they're not all the same anymore. It's, it really varies now from tradition to group to, to tradition. So another significance of initiation is that when you decide you're going to learn magic, you're going to learn witchcraft, you're going to ded dedicate yourself to, to the magical path, it is really a rite of passage. You know, it's the rite of passage to higher realms of knowledge and being in the world so it's like you're saying yes i'm going to open that door and i'm going to step through to the other side and begin this journey down this road <laughs> even if you don't know exactly where it's going to lead even though you don't know what you're going to encounter on the path um you decide it's 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 the only path worth following essentially because any path in the material world is a dead end that the, the path of spirit, magic, um, higher knowledge, wisdom, knowing who and what we truly are is really the only game in town and that that is the only path and you're committing to yourself that you're going to follow that path. It's really a commitment to yourself. Even if you're doing it in a group environment, it's still you're committing to you. There may be things that you may have to say that in, involve the group, like certain things that you're not allowed to tell other people and various things like that. But when it comes to the path itself, it's your path and no one can walk that for you. Only you can walk that path. What's great about being in a group is that you've got other people to walk with and you're not walking it alone so that's always a positive thing if you've got a teacher you've got somebody there who can help you as you're walking along as well which is really quite necessary at times on the path there's times when you can go alone and there's times when you need other people to help you out so 
that's, um, I guess, one of the advantages of being in a functional group, a good group, a, a group that is um, a helpful group, not a dysfunctional group, and um, that sort of verges more on um, egos and cults, that kind of thing. So personally, I found that initiation, my own experience of going through initiation ceremonies, was that they seem to bring people together. So when I did the coven experience of it, it's like a bringing together, you know, the people that you're being initiated with at the same time, you know, you're that cohort. Um, it's, it's like a nice little family. Thank you so much, Shane, for the super chat. It's, it's like you're, you're sharing something very special with other people, even though when you're brought into the circle, only people who are initiated would be in an initiated circle. Uh, so that would be other coven members who've already been initiated and um, the ones who've just been initiated. They're the only ones that are allowed in a circle when it comes to initiation. And if you're doing a group initiation, you just come into the circle one by one and you each get initiated, essentially. Um, this isn't secret knowledge. This is stuff you can read in a book. <laughs> so it's sort of like kept like a secret thing that if you're not initiated into that particular degree, um, then you can't participate in that ritual until you're actually initiated, which makes sense. Um, that's pretty common in most cultures around the world when it comes to group initiations. And yes, when you are initiated, hi David, yes, you are given your witch name, okay? Right at the very beginning. So the crafting, when we, were, we had our very first one after the three months probation, we were told to, you know, come up with a name. We came up with our own names. We weren't given a name. Some groups give names. Um, some traditions, they give names. Very common in Eastern traditions to be given a name rather than you choosing a name and the the lama or the sheikh or or whoever is um the person initiating you whoever your teacher is will give you a name in a lot of the eastern traditions western traditions can be a bit of both sometimes they'll give you a name other times you create the name yourself so i come came up with a name uh that was based on my numerology and so, yes, we were given a name. And then that name is traditionally what you're called if you're in a coven environment or even in a mystical group environment. From then on, you're known by that name. So that's your witch name. That's your witch identity. And if you look at the whole identity thing, Identity as pretty much a construct that we create, we create our own identity. And so what we're doing in the case of an initiation when we take a new name is we're, take, we're wanting to take on an identity that's conducive to what we want to be and what we want to have and do in our life. We're taking on our spiritual identity. We're taking on that persona, that person. And we're leaving the old one that's got a lot of limiting beliefs about not being good enough, not this, not, not that. And we're trying to leave that behind. I mean, obviously, you don't just go boom and you've left it behind. That's a long process to change your identity from who you think you are and who you've been programmed to be to who you truly are. That's a, a lot of shadow work involved in that. <laughs> um, but it's like the beginning of it. It's like you're saying, okay, I, who do I want to be in the world? How do I want to show up as? And how do I want to be in the world? How do I want to show up? And that magical name is that person. It's that, it's that identity. It's, the, it's supposed to really be the true you, the real you, not the you that, has, that you've been so far that is very much often a programmed um, version of yourself, if that makes sense. So you get your new name, you're starting a whole new thing. Now, when you're doing self-initiation, you're doing the same thing. You, you'll have a name and you'll use that name. And from then on, you, when you're doing the work yourself, you would 
and you're going into your magical self. And I, I teach that in the Mystery Witch School 101 Academy about the magical self and stepping into your magical self. You you are that person. That's the person that you are when you're doing your magic. That's the person you are when you're doing ritual. And it is you. Even if the ego part of you or the program part of you is going to say to you, oh, that's not you, you could never be like that, or you're just making that up, that's not the real you, that, that's just the ego there with the program. You're being who you want to be. You're being actually who you are underneath all of the programs that tell you you can't be a truly powerful um, human being. So when you're thinking of your name, your witch name, have a think about who you want to show up as. You know, who do you want to really be in the world? How do you want to be in the world? And how does that name fit that? Um, I mean, the name might come to you in a dream. The name might come to you in a vision. You might, um, for me, the name came when I was meditating and I heard uh, a voice say the name. So it came to me, um, which I felt at the time came to me from the goddess. But your name could come from, from various different places. And then I had to work out the spelling of it to try and fit the numerology. And um, you may even get another name further down the track in another initiation. Sometimes your names can change as you progress along the path. So you may start with a name and then you end up with a different name or you may add a name uh, or a number of names as you uh, go along your path into various different initiations. Okay, I'm just going to check to see if there's any questions. Okay. I'm just going to go back and have a look at questions. Okay. I could, um, okay. So Swaxan fan says, I refused to be born until my grandmother was there to catch me. She was the first I laid eyes on. She said I was born with my eyes wide open. Awesome. <laughs> what tarot cards are associated with the idea of initiation? Well, technically, it would be the magician. <laughs> Very much so. The initiator, initiation, beginnings, one. <laughs> but... If you're looking at the major arcana as a journey that you're setting out at the very beginning, uh, the fool decides to take the journey and the first one that they encounter, of course, is the magician. So the magician is initiating you into the tarot and then along the way you meet other, uh, other figures and other situations that are going to initiate you further into various different things. So in many ways, to be honest, each card of the major arcana is a bit of an initiation um, when you're going through uh, those aspects of life. Um, very, very much so. Okay. I see it as a way of connecting with others who have the same spirituality. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like it's the same. It's the same thing as being baptised, really. It's, it's Baptised is an initiation for a baby. Um, and a lot of the other aspects around initiation are to do with, say, with protection. So you have the protection of the lineage in the case of... Um, traditions that are part of a lineage you've got the, the protection then of all of the people who all of the beings who even the ones who have passed on of that lineage you've got the protection of the coven of the group so um it's um, getting a bit dark here because it's overcast <laughs> but it's um it's working with um that idea of, of also safety in numbers and safety within a group or safety um, within, within a lineage. Uh, what's up next while I try and put the lighting on? <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm enjoying this video. That's awesome. David in Savannah. Okay, I know that's a place in the US somewhere. <laughs> uh is your initiation oh that's right i already answered that one great okay now i've got some light do you teach hand fasting uh no i don't <laughs> okay georgia 
Okay, awesome. So let's get back to that's the significance of the initiation. Your, it's all about yourself and your path and your taking that commitment to you and your path, whether you're doing it in a group or whether you're doing it yourself, you're taking that commitment and you're making that commitment to you. And it's an important time. So even if you're doing it all by yourself, <laughs> uh, still celebrate it in some way too. You know, um, take yourself out to lunch or, or whatever is celebrating for you. Celebrate that because you're you're showing up for you. You're walking this path. You're saying, okay, this is where I want to go. And if you have a name, you've thought about your your who you want to be, who you want to show up as, as well. So it is a new beginning. When you're preparing for initiation, uh, in the case of the coven, it's really about coven learning. So you, you learn certain things at each year of study. So there's stuff you learn at the beginning, which is first degree. And first degree work, uh, it really just involves the more the ritualistic side of the craft. It will involve um, learning to work with energy. It's, it's basically... Everything that's in the Mystery Witch School 101 Academy is first degree stuff that you learn first degree. I've also thrown in a bit of second degree in the Mystery Witch School 101 Academy. And if you don't know what that is, I'll tell you what it is at the end. Um, and just to have a little bit more of a little bit of second degree in there. But first degree really is just getting the basics down. It's learning to work with the lunar energies. It's learning to create a circle. It's learning about the Sabbaths, a little bit about magic and uh, energy work and working with all that sort of stuff. It's the foundation of everything. Second degree, at least in, in the covens, covens that I was in, was really about where you learn all of the different um, aspects of the craft, like tarot and runes and palmistry. Uh, who, whoever whoever the, the senior members of the coven are who can teach um, things like that, then you would learn, have the opportunity to learn those things in second degree and then third degree is really just more about there may be some capitalistic uh stuff there that you may be learning uh, i know that there's um the inner planes that we we did in my coven um and then also you'd be learning about doing things like hand fastings and all that stuff in third degree so you're still continuing on your studies um, obviously, um, deciding probably what you really like because um, you'll learn astrology, you'd learn the tarot, all of that more advanced magic in second degree. And so you're going to be thinking, well, what do I really want to do? Because there's a lot to, there's a lot that you could be doing and it can take you a long time to really um, understand astrology or really even become really good at reading tarot as well. So the first year, the first degree is actually probably the most, um, it's it's really when you're establishing your foundation and really getting the, the nuts and bolts of, of the path. The rest is really just adding things to it um, along the way. So when you're preparing for initiation, whether it's coven or whether it is um, solo, you do want to have a bit of self-reflection, you know, and to understand why you're doing it, you know, what your motivations are for doing it. Why do you want to walk the Wiccan path or the witch path? It doesn't have to be Wiccan. It can be, you know, witchcraft in general or the magical path in general. Why do you want to walk that path? What do you feel it has there for you and what outcomes are you wanting uh, for yourself in the path? It's interesting, Sufis have a saying that we all come to the path for the wrong reasons <laughs> and it's not usually until we've been in the path for a while that we understand um, truly what the path really is about and that, yeah, we probably did come with not maybe a real understanding of what the path was because it can often show you that it's it's something completely different to what you thought it was. And it can really open your eyes up to how things really are and can be a bit of a shock to the ego, particularly along the way. So meditation practices, you know, to centre yourself, um, 
And if you know anybody or if you're, if it is a coven environment, you can always seek guidance from your mentors or elders or teachers um, to help you prepare. Some covens like to give you a test or an ordeal, if it's called in our day, um, that you would have to complete before you could be initiated. So, for example, this is a pretty common one that, that you will read about where you have to go into nature, into the forest by yourself for an evening and you can't take anything with you. You have to be uh, by yourself in the forest. And the whole philosophy behind that is that uh, witchcraft is a nature tradition and to really be on the path you have to be connecting to nature which means facing nature or, if, or facing nature in a way that may scare you which is being out there at night by yourself in the forest <laughs> and I guess it depends on where you are in the world as to how dangerous that can be fortunately in Australia it's not particularly dangerous we don't have bears and um, those sorts of high predatory animals I mean there's some wild pigs and um, yeah that's probably about it really um, so it wasn't really a scary thing for me when I had that experience it was um, raining it was very wet and of course you can't have a tent you've just got to be totally exposed to the world Back in the days of um, way back, you can read about how they used to send people into the woods naked. Um, and this, of course, is in the UK. I don't know whether that happens or not in the UK. It's pretty cold there, I believe. Um, with my coven, we were robed. We took our robes and that's all we were allowed to have, our robes. And um, some people took sleeping bags and... and um, <laughs> And uh, but really all we were supposed to have was a robe and a water bottle and that was it, okay? And we'd be out there uh, from dusk till dawn essentially and I really enjoyed it. I sang um, a lot of the night. I could see the rain coming up. I was on a ridge and um, I was looking down into a valley and I could see the rain clouds coming up over the valley up to the ridge and so I'd know that I was about to be poured on <laughs> again <laughs> I didn't sleep at all um but it was a wonderful experience and then the following night we had the actual ritual um so I enjoyed it <laughs> uh it depends where you are it was a my I can't remember what time of the year it was it was um probably a mild time of the year probably I don't know March or April or something like that Okay, but preparing for it, um, you know, you might want to to meditate on what that would be like to be in the forest by yourself and um, without having only your clothing and your water bottle with you. You can also engage in cleansing rituals as well if you want to sort of think of purifying your mind and body, so purifying oils, purifying baths. Uh, studying the text more, learning about the different traditions, you know, things which you would have already probably done anyway. Um, if you are doing a self-initiation, you may want to take yourself out into the forest and, and do it out there if it's safe. Um, I believe you should always stay safe, though, so make sure that things are safe. The, the positive thing, I guess, about being in a coven environment was that even though we're all situated in separate areas up the mountain, um, we were still, there were still other people not too far away and the whole area, you know, there was quite a lot of us that were being initiated. So we were scattered about on both ways um, on the path. So it was, uh, I guess you could say there was still a sense of safety that there were at least some other people that you could run to if you were, in, you know, you did get yourself into any trouble or something like that. Okay. So when it comes to rituals and ceremonies, that's going to depend on the coven, if it's a coven initiation, obviously, and what type of initiations they offer. 
if you're doing it yourself, then that whole thing of having a cleansing bath and purifying because it's like leaving the old and embracing the new. So it's cleansing yourself energetically, uh, casting the circle to create that space for the ritual. Obviously, if you're in a coven, that's going to happen anyway. Uh, but if you're doing it yourself, uh, yeah, cast your circle and uh, create that ritual space. Uh, invoke uh, your deities, uh, just as you would set up a circle, invoking a deity. So you'd invoke the elements, you'd invoke the deities, and then you would start the ritual celebration. There are books that have uh, initiation rites in them, self-initiation rites in them or self-dedication rites in them. And uh, I have a self-initiation right uh, at the end of the Mystery Witch School 101 Academy as well for people when they're wanting to do self-initiation. Um, but during the whole thing, you can have like a, you could maybe mix up some oils and there's various different recipes that uh, you could use, like sandalwood is a great initiating oil, for example, uh, myrrh, frankincense and anoint with the oils and as if you're sort of um it's like anointing with the oil is like signifying that you're you know you're passing through uh thresholds you're you're um you're moving through into um another realm and working with the olfactory system as well out of smell uh you're entering into the sublime and making yourself, you're cleansing yourself yet again and making yourself sacred by anointing yourself with oils. And really, the rest is really up to you and whatever ritual you're using um, from wherever you get your rituals from, if you're self-initiating. As I said, there's books out there that have self-initiation rights. The ones that I know of are the old ones, of course, the ones that I started out with because I did a self-initiation before I joined the coven, before I found the coven. So I think the one that I did was the Raymond Buckland one in his big blue book. Um, what's the blue book called? The Complete Book of Witchcraft, I think it was called. I think I did that one. and. There may have even been two in that one, a self-dedication and a self-initiation. I can't remember. I also did the Scott Cunningham one too, which was a self-dedication rite, which was in his uh, Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner. I think I did that one right at the very beginning as well when I first started out as self-initiation. The benefits, I've talked about some of the benefits, meaning that, you know, if there's transmission, then you're getting the transmission, you're getting the safety of the group, you're getting uh, the, the, if it's a group, you're getting that community support there. But the benefits of it, even if you're solo and you're doing self-initiation, is still that feeling I mean you'll come out of your own ritual feeling different you know because you've you've done something you've made a commitment to yourself so the benefits are that you're more likely to start experiencing that spiritual growth you're more likely to stick to to your practice and personal development you're deepening your connection to your own intuition to your inner wisdom because you're, still, you're on the path, you're dedicating yourself to the path um, and you're strengthening your bonds too to the community. Even if you're solo, the fact that you're practising and you're doing all this puts you in as a part of, I guess, the witchcraft community. And even if you aren't part of a, a coven, you're still part of the community. When I was in my first coven, we had two solitaries that used to come and uh, we used to do a lot of work with them, actually. They had a property, and a rural property. It had this beautiful circle set up on their property. And, you know, they taught as well. They ran workshops. But they were solitary practitioners. They were Wiccan and they were solitary. And they would come and join us for our open uh, Sabbaths. So when we would do our Sabbaths, they'd be open to the public and people could come and join in or they could sit and watch because we were a training coven. 
And they'd often come along and participate just to be part of, you know, the community, part of a group, doing something together with other people, and they were solitaries. So you can still be a solitary and still be part of a community and part of a group. It really just depends on what groups are around and um, how open they are, I guess, to other people joining in from time to time. Uh, it was pretty, pretty open and pretty friendly back in the 90s, I guess, um, the pagan community. There were pagans from many different places and different types of pagans uh, or witches that would come together and we would have they would, we would sometimes have rituals with these, these solitaries at their place. They would put on the ritual and they'd invite different groups. Um, our coven would be one of them that would come. And so sometimes we'd be part of it. A number of covens would get together and do things. It's, um, or at a group, sometimes there was a, a druid group that we used to also uh, do things with as well. So it was pretty open uh, back then in the uh, 90s for us. Okay, I'm just going to go back to comments again. I hope I haven't missed any. Okay, is there such thing as a soul contract being hijacked, sent into the wrong family and sidetracked from realising and or becoming who they really are? I don't know how that would happen, um, like who would be doing the hijacking. Um, it's not something that... I would be aware that would happen, um, but um, like you're sent to the wrong family and sidetracked from realizing and or becoming. I know that there are there are traditions that believe that you can do things to to people once they're dead or their souls once they're dead, once they've passed. Um, the the feeling of being hijacked may be coming simply from the fact that the upbringing itself has been very, very traumatic and you kind of feel like you've been put in the wrong place. Um, but from wherever you are, you your higher self is there guiding you to where you need to be or where you want to be. Um, Can you please help me out the spell, make a spell? Um, not right at the moment, obviously. We're talking initiations. Um, I do teach spell crafting, though. So if you do want to do, uh, if you do want to create a spell and you want um, my help to do that, um, you can always book in a mentoring session with me. There is actually a link in the description field below this video. Um, to contact me about it, yeah. Um, my grandpa did that to me at the age of 13, but it was right of passage from childhood to manhood. I was dropped off in the middle of the swamp with no food and no water but with survival knowledge. Awesome. That is just so great that you you had that opportunity because a, a, a lot of people don't have that um, these days. And if you look at traditional cultures, uh, a lot of their initiation ceremonies were, you know, about, turning the child into an adult <laughs> and it was at around that age that, that they would be um, experiencing, you know, that initiation depending on whether they're boys or girls um, that have different initiations obviously because they had different functions in the community that, um, yeah, it's, um, it does change you. It does change you and learning to survive is uh, very important. It's very important. I had an uncle that went um, that went missing when he was a child. I don't know how old he was. He was quite young, probably about 10 or 11 or something. He, he got lost, but because he had grown up in the country and he did have survival skills, he was fine. Um, nothing happened to him when he was found. He was, he was well. He was good because he was able to survive in the wild by himself. <laughs> okay. So some of the books that I've suggested are some of those older books, such as Raymond Buckland's books and uh, Scott Cunningham's books. But, you know, they're pretty old now. <laughs> There's a lot more since then. Okay. Uh, rites of passage, I think Americans don't really have. No, we've lost it in Western culture. We've lost it in Western culture. And it shows that we've lost it. Um, 
It is, yeah. If you've got a background in traditional cultures uh, from anywhere in the world, then you may still have that as a part of your experience. Okay. How do you find a coven in your area? Logan. Well, there, there should be covens in Logan, um, for sure, because my first coven, um, well, okay, they were in Beanley originally and then they, they left Beanley and came to, they hived off and formed a coven and then um, the coven hived off again and one way went to Ipswich and the other stayed in Brisbane. Um, definitely in Logan, there are definitely pagans there. So it would be a case of... Um, going to bookstores, esoteric bookstores, looking online um, and finding who's around that area because I do know that there are some um, on the south side, so around that area at least there, there would be. So search out, go on Facebook, go to bookstores, magical bookstores, um, even the annual mind body spirit festival that we have in brisbane every year uh you may find connections there as well so meetup groups <laughs> um yeah because i'm i'm not familiar with that side of town anymore but i definitely know in the past there's definitely been groups over there okay came out of the swamp heavier than a man <laughs> okay <laughs> Old books, yeah, old books are cool. Okay, so to finish it off, um, I found that I guess for me the benefits of initiation was the the experience of it essentially the um, camaraderie afterwards in a group environment when it came to ones I've experienced for myself when I've dedicated myself or did self-initiation right at the get-go. Uh, there was still this feeling of achievement like I'd done something. <laughs> And it felt good. It felt special. It felt like me. It felt like home. Again, I talk a lot about the home feeling, like feeling like coming home when you found a spiritual tradition that is that fits you like a glove and it's like coming home. It's like you've been there before and that that's where you live. <laughs> that's pretty much what the – that's pretty much what um, it is – what the experience was like for me. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, the whole necessity thing. Yeah. Okay, there's one at the Gold Coast. Yeah, there's definitely should be some in Logan. Absolutely. Pandora, yeah. <laughs> or around that area, maybe Beanley, that kind of, you know, area between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. Um, now, the necessity of initiation, it's not mandatory, obviously, for practising witchcraft. Um, it's a choice you make, okay? And But when it comes to covens, it usually is mandatory. You can't really progress in the coven or probably even join the coven without an initiation because it's the way groups work and the way those particular groups do work. Uh, some traditions may require different types of initiations for different levels that you go, and you may even decide that you want to do different initiations for different levels that you feel that you achieve. Uh, it's really up to you how you do that. Um, with a group, it's it's usually because they're trying to organise people and you kind of want certain cohorts um, You've got different cohorts of people who've, who've started at different times and so you kind of initiate it in batches <laughs> if it's a big enough group and you would have like the first years, the second years and the third years. That's what it was like in my experience anyway. And you'd be initiated into the next level once you've done all of the curriculum from that level and had done the test or the ordeal. Um, the for example, I'll give you this, the second um, degree test was actually in astrology. <laughs> um, so um, I think the first degree test was psychometry. So that's where you take an object and you read the object, like that object is to tell you about the person who owns the object. 
And so that was the one for first degree initiation and, um, for example. Uh, the staying out at night by ourselves was was the very first was the first one um, first was actually initiation that we did that one and these are things you'll probably find also pretty common each degrees you're going to have to uh, have a test like an exam okay um, initiations can also offer structure as well. So this is coming back to like any kind of learning environment in Western culture anyway. We tend to structure our learning in first stages. So if you're uh, going to university, for example, it would be first year, second year, third year or fourth year, depending on how long the degree is. And then you've got, you know, honours or we have masters and then a PhD and all that kind of thing. That's a very Western thing. And because Wicca kind of initially followed the Masonic thing of the three degrees, it kind of works that way. You learn, you have this curriculum and then you finish this curriculum, you do a test and then you get this initiation. <laughs> With Eastern traditions, it's a bit different. Uh, the Eastern traditions aren't chronological. They're not like this is what you do for this amount of time and then you go on to the next level. So traditionally in Wicca, right back in the Gardnerian times, it was a year and a day for each degree. So you only have to be studying the craft for three or four years to reach third degree, which really isn't a very long time to be walking the magical path um, or the spiritual path for that matter. Whereas in other traditions like, say, Sufi traditions, for example, you could be on the same level of initiation for years before they before you're up to the next level. <laughs> and other people can go through it faster than others. So it Different cultures have different ways of doing this. Um, in Western culture, we tend to go, this is the curriculum for the first degree, okay? You do it all, you do the test, you pass, you get your first degree initiation. This is the curriculum for the second degree. You do it all, you pass the test, you get to go on. Do you, you get your second degree initiation, you get to go on. That's kind of how it is in the West. Okay, um, I talked about belonging and community support. I'm just looking at my notes here. About as far as necessity is concerned, it's not necessary, okay, unless you're in a group. But if you can make that commitment to your path and turn up for yourself and commit to it, you're doing yourself a favour because this is your path. This is the path to you. Um, you could see it as a path to the gods, but really this is your spirituality isn't isn't about the gods. <laughs> you know, we work with the gods and they're great to work with, but our spirituality is, is ourselves. It's our path back to ourselves. It's back to who we are. It's back to our true selves. It's back to understanding what the hell we're doing here in the first place and what we can do here while we're here. It doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter what our past lives were. It's what we're doing right here, right now, in the now, because there's only the now. There is no past. There is no future. There is only now. And what are you doing in the now towards your path, towards being fully alive in this moment, feeling connected to yourself, feeling connected to nature, feeling connected to, to the spiritual, you know, where are you right here, right now? And that's what the spiritual path is all about. It, it's not about worshipping gods. It's not about, you know, having to be um, subordinate to deities or gods or anything like that. It's about working with the god forces and spiritual forces to walk our path and remember who we are and create here on planet Earth. That's really what this path is about and that's what's so wonderful about it. It's, it's the path back to yourself and connecting back to yourself again, essentially. And that's the whole reason I teach this is because of that. Um, this is something I learned probably more within Sufism than I did in Wicca because back in the days when I was in the covens, I was a lot younger. And uh, the teachers that I had back then were 
they weren't necessarily, I mean, they're very skilled in magic, but that was really their thing. Uh, the whole sort of more mystical aspect and the psychological aspect of the path came later with different teachers. And that's what opened my eyes up to the, the whole thing that, you know, witchcraft can be a path back to who you truly are. It can be more than doing spells. It can be more than, you know, um, the, the lower side of witchcraft, I guess you could say, the commercial side of witchcraft or the, um, the Hollywood side of it, <laughs> uh, that, that sort of, you know, takes it down to its lowest common denominator and sees witchcraft as being something that is very destructive and very much about, you know, getting back at people and harming people and this, that and the other. That's like at the most base level that you could get with this. And it's not where this can take you. It can take you way beyond that base ego level. It can really take you to who you truly are and, and lift you beyond all of that. And um, that's the whole reason for Mystery Witch School. It's the whole reason for the Mystery Witch School 101 Academy, which is my 12-month course that I offer on Wicca and Witchcraft, which is the whole, as I said, it's somewhere else in the, the live that it, it basically covers the whole of the first first degree plus a little bit of second degree in there. That gives you the basics. It gives you a structure to practice and learn in. It gives you community. It's an online community. And it also means that you've got somebody to help you along the way and other people to help you along the way um, as well. So you've got me to help you and also other people who've been part of the academy for since it began, which I think was back in early 2019 so it's um the whole idea of of what I do is to bring witchcraft to a higher level than where it's currently perceived and to make it a path that you can walk to find the real joy in life and and get out of the the matrix I guess <laughs> if you want to call call the um it's not so much the 3D world as the matrix, but our perceptions, the way that we've been conditioned to perceive the world as the matrix. Yeah. So if you are interested in learning Wicca and Witchcraft with me, then I will put the link to the Mystery Witch School Academy in the chat. You can also find it in the description field underneath the video too and on my website, mysterywitchschool.com. Okay. Would your life path number be a good indicator of which path to take when it comes to the left hand or the right hand? Um, possibly. Um, I think you could probably do either um, with your numerology. Um, really, yeah. Oh, yeah, there'd probably be more to it than just your numerology. And the way to know which path is right for you is actually to ask yourself <laughs> which path is right for you, which one you feel is the right path for you, um, rather than relying on tools like numerology or, or divination. Um, it's knowing deep down inside what path is right for you. Just put your hand on your heart chakra and ask yourself that question and see which answer feels like it's the right one okay um which one feels like the right one because there may be ego aspects that are telling you that one's not the right one uh for whatever reason go with where it feels right in the heart to go um you may find that you may oscillate between the two as well and find something in the middle. You know, it could be a case of um, it's time to journey this way now and then later on you journey the other way and then you, you realise that the middle way is the only way. <laughs> like Buddha, the middle way is the way. Um, so, yeah, um, your numerology is there to guide you in your life journey and help you understand yourself but your heart's the one that's going to show you, tell you where to go and when to go. So, yeah, do that. Okay, everybody, it's not easy being a god. No, it isn't. It's not easy trying to remember that we're gods. 
and getting back to being gods because we forgot and um, we were tricked into believing we weren't and so it's, it's, it's a hard road to get back to doing it again, believing it again, absolutely. Okay, everybody, have a wonderful week. I'll see you again uh, next week. It'll be the day before the eclipse, which is going to be a doozy, I believe. So, um, yeah, hold on tight uh, to your witch's hats and your brooms and um, we'll see you uh, next week. So blessed be, everybody.